The year is 2005. Aside from one ill-fated attempt nearly a decade earlier, Doctor Who has been off the air for 16 years. Fans across the world are waiting eagerly for the moment they have been waiting for that whole time, the moment when a new series of Doctor Who would grace their television screens once again. This was the most exciting moment one could possibly imagine as a fan of Doctor Who. Or at least, I suppose it was. The thing is, I was a child at the time, and as much as I hate to admit it, Rose was just as much my introduction to this series as it was to millions of others. I therefore probably owed this episode far more than I'd care to admit, as being the ultimate genesis of the spark that would be my interest in this series. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, or rather more accurately, the journey of several years of being a saddo begins with a single 45 minutes. Bit less snappy. With 18 years behind us, and the knowledge that the revival of Doctor Who was successful beyond even the wildest dreams of those fans watching on that spring night in 2005 fresh in our minds, it's perhaps a little easier to look at Rose with fresher eyes. After all, the whole success of this episode is predicated on having launched Doctor Who back to the world, but, you know, it's kind of already done that, Doctor Who's there now. As hard as it may be, it does need to be looked at as an episode on its own. And I think it's time that someone that has a clear and analytical understanding of the structure of science fiction takes a deep look into the writing and production of this episode with the knowledge and expertise to back it up. Unfortunately, I can't find anyone like that, so I'm going to do it instead. So, without any further ado... As much as I wish I could, though, I don't think it's actually all that possible to look at this as a normal episode. In the end, this is the second most important episode in the show's history, beaten only by that first broadcast on 23 November 1963, and more relevantly, the one that launched a cult science fiction show to unprecedented worldwide success. To treat it the same way I would Megloss or Journey to the Center of the TARDIS or something like that, it would just be pretty ridiculous. I judge this episode, therefore, first of all as a tool to relaunch the series, and there is a success. Here's why. The episode does a very good job of reintroducing the audience to the show's key key concepts. The Doctor, the TARDIS, time and space travel, the companions and the enemies, the setup of the adventures, and how that ties into the show's premise. It does a great job of making sure these absolute basics of the show are put across within that 45 minutes, but doing so without overloading them with too much information. The episode's structure is obviously specifically designed with this in mind, and it works. It definitely avoids the TV movie trap of putting in too much to become an inaccessible continuity lockout, but also avoids not saying enough and feeling too distant from the classic series. It's also paced perfectly to do this, the initial burst of action and introduction of the Doctor within the first five minutes giving a glimpse of what's going on without breaking too much mystery. As the episode goes on, more and more is revealed, and the episode also does a very good job of making sure that the audience learns these things at the same time Rose does. It's also the case that by the end, we know enough who the Doctor is, how he operates, what the TARDIS does and that it can move in time and space, the kind of enemies we'll come across and how the Doctor would deal with them, and etc and so forth. But there's enough mystery there to keep the new viewer hooked, the Doctor's origins and nature are still a mystery to the uninformed, and even to returning fans the mention of the war is a tantalising hook. That pretty much all of it was told to us in an exposition dump a week later instead of being spread out across the series was a less impressive way of doing things, but uh, nevertheless... Speaking of returning fans, RTT did know that he had to keep them on board, and he does a good job of doing so. By drip-feeding information to the new audience, he simultaneously teases the fans, a few shots of the TARDIS, a few drops of information from the Doctor, enough to keep them hooked in as things unravel. This is also helped by the perfect choice of a returning enemy for this introductory episode. Just as The Master was a poor choice for the TV movie due to the backstory and continuity this would entail, the Autons are not only a pretty continuity-free enemy with a pretty simple motivation, they are also part of Doctor Who's place in British popular culture. Arguably, the rampaging shop window dummies from Spearhead from Space is the most famous image from the classic series that doesn't include the Daleks, the TARDIS, or the Fourth Doctor's scarf. Bringing back an enemy that would invoke nostalgia among older non-fans from a famous scene from 30 years before, and was well regarded among fans themselves, while not having any backstory to scare off news fans seems like the blazing overly obvious choice, yet given the TV movie's failings in this regard, RTD does get the credit where it's due. Finally, I feel RTD also did a good job in updating the series for the modern era. The scene I point to here is when the Doctor is looking for the nesting transmitter, and Rose points out the London Eye. This grounds the series in the contemporary world of viewing British public would be familiar with, and presents a familiar image for the series to set herself alongside, just in the same way contemporary London would have done so in the third Doctor's era. There are plenty of examples in this, grounding the series in the modern era, while keeping the feel of the series. It's a little thing, but it no doubt helped prevent the new series feel like just a throwback like it quite easily could have done. Now the effects of the relaunch has been examined, let's look at the actual script. The character of the Doctor was the most important thing that had to be established in this series. All that effort I just talked about would have been completely wasted had they made a new Doctor into a Twin Dilemma-style arsehole. 
They didn't, though, funnily enough. His character mostly works well. I do have some problems with it, though. There's a particular scene I'd like to highlight to show what I mean. Well then, tip in your antiplastic and let's go. I'm not here to kill it. I've got to give it a chance. This interaction, I think, was perhaps the episode's most important task, to establish the Doctor as not a gung-ho hero who blows things up first and asks questions later. He's non-violent first, and is a negotiator and empathiser. And despite later distortions of the non-violence element to ridiculous levels, it's also important to show he can resort to violence as a last resort if it's the only way to make sure he does what's right, hence the anti-plastic. The issue is, is this didn't quite gel with how things are written before and after this scene. He seemed too eager to resort to the anti-plastic when he was talking to Rose on the embankment, especially as I want to negotiate with it first would have established to her as well as the audience those traits I listed above, setting her extremely sceptical mind at ease at this point, let's not forget. After he confronts the nest team when he tries to explain it that the anti-plastic was just an insurance, it sounds so obviously bullshit, like he's a guy in debt having a meeting with a mob boss who's just been searching a pistol found on him. Honestly, I swear I wasn't going to use it. It makes his determination to negotiate look phony, which undermines the character we know. If this was intentional to show the Doctor has been changed by the war, then fair enough, but it doesn't really square with his own protestations later on about how he feels guilty about being able to save the Nestean planet, and pretty much, well, his entire character arc across the RTD era. To be fair, part of it may have been the delivery, and given the director's performance in the rest of the episode, it seems plausible. But it nevertheless undermines that part of the character trying to be established. The idea that he's a peacemaker first and a warrior second seems rather less plausible when he's just negotiating the bullshit and by time. If you think I'm focusing too much on this one scene, let me give you another example. In the first third or so of the episode, it's when the Doctor remains a mysterious and aloof figure, and both Rose and the audience learn about him at a deliberately slow pace, to build anticipation and keep new audiences guessing and building up their views of what the character is before more things are revealed. That he doesn't feel obligated to tell Rose a bloody thing also works in creating this mystery and establishing his modus operandi. What doesn't work about these scenes, however, is how bizarrely dismissive he is of Rose's life. Rudely telling her to piss off and go back to her boring life when he's no known for all of about 90 seconds makes him seem to me like a bit of an ass. and this is repeated when they're walking and talking in the estate. He basically tells her she's boring and to piss off. It undermines the mystery about him by showing him to be so dismissive and rude for no reason, especially as he's supposed to be fighting here to save the people of his adopted home planet following his actual home planet being destroyed. Surely he'd probably care about him a bit more than that. It's also odd that a major theme of this episode is Rose's boring life, but there's zero reason the Doctor would know about that other than, well, reading the script. It's not a huge thing, I guess, but it does feel inconsistent, especially with how the Doctor's insults towards humanity later on in the episode do make a bit more sense, and are more easily thrown back at him by Rose. I should mention the one person who deserves full credit for their efforts in this episode is Christopher Eccleston, who falls into the role immediately and plays this with the assuredness of someone who'd been doing it for far longer than he had. Arguably, this is the quickest an actor has settled into the part and made it his own since Tom Baker, and certainly in my view none of his successors have managed it this quickly. His impatience is clearly barely just below the surface, in ways that make sense like berating humanity for pollution and other vices, and I suppose in ways that don't make sense like reading the script to find out Rose is bored with her life and having a go at her for it. But he also plays it with just the right amount, enough to make a clear motivation and trait for him, but also not enough to make him an arsehole like the early Sixth Doctor. And he achieves this by making sure his humanity, for lack of a better word, is clearly on show as well. Eccleston performs a passionate defense of humanity to the Nestine perfectly as an example of this. He finds the balance on his first attempt, larger than life, but not so large that he becomes unlikable. Unfortunately, these efforts aren't always held by the writing. The Nestine negotiation scene is an example of this. It's a mishmash of different ideas that comes out as a mess. The Doctor starts by blabbering useless and made-up protocols that's only really a step above the scientific technobabble that's become a sci-fi cliché. These do absolutely nothing except burn time. He then decides to open negotiation with an insult, then decides to insult the humans he's trying to get the Nestines not to destroy, then failing to justify his having the anti-plastic as previously mentioned. It feels unfocused and doesn't play to the strengths of the character that have been set up. A genuine attempt at negotiation which ends in betrayal by the Nestine without finding out about the anti-plastic, which... Let's be honest, if someone I was negotiating came in with a gun, I'd be fairly miffed and would be somewhat more inclined to do what they didn't want me to do. Although, I'm just petty like that. And that would have been a much better idea, setting the Doctor up as a peacemaker, but also one willing to use his plan B if necessary. That's purely from a character standpoint as well, there are so many holes in this scene, but uh, we'll get to those. Anyway, moving on, Rose's character is for me a bit of a weak link in this. I'm not really a fan of Rose in general, but I don't outright loathe her like I do Clara, I've always found her to be a bit too perfect due to the way the scripts are structured, and somewhat arrogant and unlikable as a result. This is, to be fair, way more of an issue in Series 2 than Series 1, and in this episode in particular is not much of a problem. 
The problem I do have is my other main problem with this character for her time on the series, that sometimes she's just too flat and almost blank and difficult to identify with as a result. She's there to fit the audience identification role in the script and not really much more. She's bored of her life, and um, that's more or less about it. While the opening does a good job of showing she's stuck in a nothing routine, what this actually means for her is not properly explored. To me personally, I think it's a consequence of New Who's episode format. It has to be so rushed to fit everything in 45 minutes, the Doctor has to show up soon enough as this can't be explored. Yeah, I get it, she's bored, but honestly I don't even get that feeling she's particularly yearning for more, or what shape that more might entail. It's just not looked at at all. She just sort of gets thrown into it, regardless of what it actually means for her or not. I don't feel her motivations are strong enough at any point. She follows the Doctor purely out of morbid curiosity, it seems. She, understandably, wants to know what the hell's going on, but that's all it seems, and it doesn't feel satisfying enough that she joins the TARDIS just on the base of that. Perhaps that was the point, but I don't really see it. The whole point is showing that the Doctor arriving is giving her what she needs, a disruption from her monotonous life, rather than just she was curious and the trail led her to that conclusion. Her getting involved in the action, with cheesy self-narration of course, comes out of nowhere really, she hasn't actually done anything to demonstrate bravery and physical ability, at least not at any point before that in this episode, maybe she had like, in Russell T Davies dreams or something and he just forgot to put it in. Her actions don't really make much sense as well throughout the episodes, if I'd seen that all she had by the middle of the episodes, such as walking shop window dummies killing people and a guy nearly strangled by a plastic hand, I don't know if my response would be, oh, I might call the police and do a google search, especially someone with a life as boring as we've been shown. I certainly wouldn't be as dismissive of Clive, the things he's showing you are clearly something very odd and don't even seem that far off what you've already seen. Oh, and poor old Wilson getting the shaft when she doesn't think anyone is in danger of death. She just feels like a bit of a blank slate, without real characterization, there to do whatever is required to make the script work, and as a consequence I find it difficult to identify with her. The rest of the characters also just kind of exist to fill functions in the script. Jackie's just a nothing character at this point, she's there to be the mum and say mildly unfunny lines and that's it. Any life she is given is entirely down to Camille Caudry, who brings so much to the character here and throughout subsequent appearances, far, far more than she was ever given in the script. Given the accusations that have been made towards his actor, I don't feel anything like as bad as Mickey as I used to, but I think it's still worth pointing out he's written like a barely functional idiot, and future appearances throughout the series confirm him to really harshly treated butter jokes in a way I've never really felt comfortable with. And yes, nowadays I have to be very careful not to conflate actor and character, given I do feel very bad for the latter, and most certainly do not for the former. Anyway. Boy, hasn't Agent Mulder let himself go? Oh, wait, hang on. Yeah, Clive's a bit of an enigma in this script for me. I've always kind of seen a bit of a Wilderness Years fan in him, but to be honest I'm becoming less and less convinced that's the case. It's less honest devotion to something he cares about and more... Well, conspiracy nut, making fun of the kind of conspiracy theories that have been prominent in the 90s and noughties before social media happened and they all turned into undisguised fascists. The thing is, though, is that, like, he's right. He, he's totally vindicated. The Doctor is more or less exactly what he thinks he is. Well, I mean, I guess he's wrong that the things are the Doctor's fault, but he's right to connect the dots he's seen and the death follows him around. So, is RTD's point these conspiracy nuts are actually right and we should all listen to them? I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess this isn't the intended point, but it, it's certainly a bit confused. Unless the point was literally just an excuse to show the really fake looking photos of him at the JFK assassination and before the Titanic left and all that to show the time travel aspects and Clive was just a convenient way to do it. In which case, congratulations for making me think harder than I should have done about your disposable character. Oh, and his incredibly mean-spirited death has never sat particularly right with me. Especially as it's not as if he was some sceptic who learnt too late that he had to take these things seriously. He was completely right, and he dies anyway. Congratulations, your investigations were completely right. Here's your reward. Kablam! Aside from the characters, the plot itself is also fairly flimsy. Yeah, yeah, I do get it wasn't really the point of this. The point was reintroducing for show and introducing the new characters, but I'm only really willing to go up with this to a point. The Autons are invading, fine, but they're rather taking their time to actually get on with it, aren't they? For a reason we're not quite sure about. Yeah, it takes the TARDIS being detected to force their hand and into the final phase, but there doesn't appear to be any real reason why they were waiting in the first place. They appear totally ready once they actually do activate that final phase, so... Were they just giving the humans a sporting chance? Or were they aching for someone to turn up to explain their evil plan to Bond villain style? And how did they end up in such a convenient secret lair beneath the London Eye? That's left entirely to the imagination how they managed to fit in there. 
as is how they managed to get the TARDIS across the Thames and into the secret lair, come to think of it. What, did the floor open up and enter a secret conveyor belt conveniently under that location? And that's me being generous. I seriously hope they aren't expecting me to believe that two Autons picked up this thing and carried it across Westminster Bridge with absolutely no one noticing. To me, to you, to me, to you. Also, anti-plastic. That's a lazy MacGuffin if I've ever heard one. I'm not sure whether the fact is literally just an end the episode button, or the fact there is apparently a substance that is anti the entire material of plastic is more insulting. Oh no, Doctor! Watch out! That baddie's got some anti-leather for your jacket! Oh no! Some anti-skin! Oh no! Some anti-poorly thought-out scripts! We're really in trouble here! Yeah, 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 I know you were pressed for time. There's a lot to fit in 45 minutes, but guess whose fault that is for choosing the format? The new episode formats are ramped for another day, but safe to say the restrictions it places on how much you can develop the scripts are probably as good a root cause as any of these scripting problems. Also, the Autumn just holds the anti-plastic out in a spot that can be conveniently knocked into the nest theme by Rose. Maybe, I don't know, go and pit it in the bin? Seems like it could have avoided quite a few headaches there. There are also way of more examples of stuff like this. For instance, why is Mickey still alive at the end of all this? Doctor, they kept him alive! Yeah, that was always a possibility. Keep him alive to maintain the copy. Okay, yes, that was established in Spearhead from Space, but the duplicate melted. So, after that, what was the point? My best guess is that the two Autons we know are in the room with them were on a coffee break or something. That's the best that I can figure. Also, exactly why was the Nestine animating those Autons in the shop basement at the beginning? First in London department store, then the world! And why did the Doctor blow them up into the way that would put people in danger and draw massive amounts of attention to the event, given ten minutes later he shuts the arm off using the Sonic? Speaking of which, why does he wait until Rose pulls the arm off him to shut it off to the Sonic, rather than, like, immediately reaching into his pocket and grabbing it? And what exactly was his plan to find an Asthene if the Autons didn't make a duplicate of someone, given he did that by triangulating the signal from the duplicate? And again, that's me being generous by suggesting he could only do it from duplicates. I seriously hope they aren't suggesting he could have done that from any old Auton, but just didn't up until that point. And while the London Eye bit is funny, and an important means of creating audience identification with the contemporary era that it was being shown in, it also doesn't really make any sense. I'm not an electrician, but I do think a transmitter requires a bit more than a circle with metal bits in it. Clive's scene is also a great example of this. First of all, given the implication was the regeneration was quite recent, how did he find the time to go to 1963 and 1912 and all that, but without seeing his reflection? He had plenty of adventures, but hasn't found a mirror yet. Yeah, yeah, I know, big finish wreck on this, but that wasn't actually in the episode, so it doesn't count. Oh, and listen to this. There's one constant companion. Who's that? Death. How the bloody hell do you know? That's a hell of a conclusion to reach based on some photos and some ghost stories. As far as I can see, Clive is either making a very, very good guess, or, well, he's read the script. Those are the only two options. Frankly, as far as you're worried, save the lives of those people who are going to get on the Titanic, so I'd say he told his constant companion to piss off that day, eh? This may sound like nitpicking, and sure, if this kind of thing happens like once or twice, then I'm willing to let it go, but for there to be several gaping holes in the script is a sign of a plot that's not been thought out properly. Having logical consistency to the universe and the actions of the characters that make sense is quite important, actually. And being more lenient than I otherwise would be for a plot this flimsy because of how clearly intended it was to be a backdrop to the re-establishment of the show and the characters. For instance, the fact that all of Clive's photos are of the Ninth Doctor makes very little sense from an in-universe point of view, but was obviously necessary given what the episode's purpose was. And frankly, by New Who's standards, this isn't even that bad overall. It would be considered a win by Moffat's standards, that's for sure. But it doesn't excuse it entirely. Oh, and why is Rose giving the lottery money to the CEO? He's an electrician, not a bloody bursar. What's he going to do with it? Alright, that one's pretty nitpicky. Let's move on. The dialogue's a mixed bag. Overall, it flows quite naturally and certainly miles above the crap Stephen Moffat would later fart out, but there are some duds. But what's it all for? I mean, shop window dummies. What's that about? Is someone trying to take over Britain's shops? <laughs> no. Well, no. It's not a price war. <laughs> Yeah, layering your crap jokes in irony doesn't make them any less crap, Russell. Oh, and we all remember this, right? If you are an alien, how come you sound like you're from the North? Lots of planets have a North. Yeah, she didn't mean the North of the planet, though, did she? Every British person is from the North of the planet, including her, me, and the idiot who wrote this line. So it's not much of a point of difference. Yeah, yeah, I get what the joke was trying to do, but A, it's not funny, and B, it makes the doctor look unnecessarily petty, given that's his response to a pretty perfectly reasonable question from her. But then again, immediately afterwards is the explanation of the police box disguise, which is fairly funny, so 
you know, they'll swing back and forth. Anyway, the overdramatic speech that comes after the estate conversation, while not bad in isolation, starts to trend across New Hoover I do strongly dislike, where in-character interactions are replaced by moments of silly spectacle. He didn't need to pontificate to explain to Rose here, especially as you can imagine pretty much every other incarnation before this brushing her off without any real explanation without a moment's thought. And certainly with Fit into Nine's character at this point, Piss Off would have been more in character than, alas, poor Yorick. But then Russell wouldn't have had got to impress everyone with his dramatic speech writing, even if it makes no sense and is just silly in hindsight. Also, several of the more adult jokes across the episode are just flat out not funny. The one where Jackie flirts is either a very childish ha 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 sex exists joke or is one that's very mean spirited towards Jackie and I'm uh, not a fan either way. The big problem with the episode though is not really in the script. It's hardly stellar, but especially considering what it had to do, it does work well enough and even by overall New Who standards, it's fine. Now, the issue is not with who put the words on the page, but who put the frames on the screen. I should point out my interest in this sort of thing is mostly in writing. My knowledge of the actual filmmaking side of it is not extensive, but having said that, I do know bad direction when I see it, and this most certainly qualifies. Apart from the fact that we now know Keith Boak was allegedly an incompetent manager who allegedly actively put the lives of people on the set in danger, and allegedly fucked off his main star to the point where he quit his huge once-in-a-lifetime role after one series, you can tell by just what's on the screen how poorly he handled this episode. So many shots are so poorly composed by not focusing on what they should be or being staged or framed at odd angles or in bizarre ways. The episode is plagued by shots just being cut in random places frequently with no reason, sometimes just cutting back to the first thing again as if the episode of the AGHD and can't focus on one shot. Look at the initial Auton scene. That clang has no visual cue at all. Which, you know, it would be fine if there was A, a clear idea of what caused it, or B, this is trying to build suspense across the scene. But given it's only a few seconds later that we see the Auton moving, it's just bizarrely out of place. I mean, it's not as if the Auton caused that noise. Once the running bit starts, it just gets worse. Random cuts are just another weird angle of what's already happening before just cutting back. And look at this from the Auton attack at the end. The poor framing, the bizarre cutting, and Jackie just standing there like a cartoon character about to show a speech bubble with her thought processes. It's just awful. This style means so many of the action scenes have no real tension to them, prevented by the bizarre framing and editing distracting the attention. Dialogue and character scenes are also not given anything interesting visually. A dull, continual wide shot here. Oh, and an important bit when the TARDIS demotorialization noise is heard for the first time, obviously because we shot of Rose's shoes. Of course. Perhaps Boke wasn't like an anti-George Lucas, terrible at the technical aspects but good with actors and that's why the performances in the episode are good, but um, yeah, I'm not so sure if I'm going to be honest. It's not the only issue on the production side though, the CGI in most of this is nothing short of laughable. Right from the opening shot of the Earth, to the wheelie bin, to Auton Mickey, to the nesting itself. If Classic Who's effects are fair game then so is this. But frankly, this is aged far worse than many of the practical effects from the Classic series. So you want about, say, the bubble wrap from the Ark in Space, but the way the actor is doing such a good job of playing it straight means it's easier to take more seriously than it otherwise would be. Whereas it's just not possible to do that opposite a tennis ball on a stick that's going to be turned into something that looks straight out of a low-end PS2 game. Yeah, yeah, I know, anti-CGI rants were a boring cliche a long time ago, so I won't waste any more time on it, but come on. Also, Murray Gold's early music is not that great. The grand orchestral stuff he did later, they got very tired quickly, but, you know, it had it in some moments, and he produced several very memorable tracks. And it didn't sound like it came from a PS2 racing game or a school geography documentary like it does in this episode. It doesn't help how it's mixed a lot of the time, of course. In the opening scene, it cuts from being mixed normally to being the background music in the department store. Listen. I mean, fuck, if that's not a damning indictment, I don't know what is. Your music is good enough to be in the background while people are shopping, Murray. I'm surprised he didn't just pack it up there and then. I'm glad he didn't, of course, then we wouldn't have the bang of it as this is going for him, several lovers. Bearing in mind the final score is a measure of how the episode holds up compared to the rest of New Who and nothing else. If you can guess who I shamelessly stole this scoring system from, you win a gold star. The final score for Rose is 6 out of 10. Slightly above average for New Who, with the caveat that I am being more lenient than I usually would be about several things because of the specific job the episode does in reintroducing the world to Doctor Who and how well it does it. There's no denying it does that very well, as the 45 minute introduction to the series it hits all the right beats and does all the right things. 
The episode itself is also not without merit, of course. The character of the Doctor is very well established, and Eccleston does brilliantly with it. It's a cliche to say these days, but it, it's a shame he only did one series, as he slots into the role pretty much flawlessly. It's a shame the other characters don't really stack up, and the weak plotting and piss-ball direction further drag it down, but overall, it's a watchable piece on its own, and a very well-crafted introduction to the series when taken on those terms, which means I'd say it averages out that just slightly better than what you'd normally expect from New Who. Well, thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this, and would like to see more, please do like and subscribe. If there's any specific episode you'd like to see, then please let me know and I'll see what I can do. Please stick to televised Doctor Who, so that's uh, classic Who or new Who only, please. Thanks very much for watching, and see you around.